Make sure your Bibles stay open there to Exodus chapter 17. Again, this morning's message is the theory or the theme for the series is all the way by faith. But the question is, is the Lord among us or not? That's an amazing question for the children of Israel to ask after what they've been through. It's an amazing question for the children of Israel after all they'd seen and after all God had done to come to the place where they tempted God with the question, is the Lord among us or not? Most of us know the story up to this point. The children of Israel are relatively new out of Egypt. They've been slaved for 400 years and now they've been delivered and on the way to the promised land. But on the way to the promised land, they were still having some very carnal issues, living right, doing right, being right, trusting God, obeying God. One of their big issues was they complained and murmured all the time. So we have here just an amazing thing. It's just another example of problem followed with panic, dealt with with prayer, and then provision given. So they have a problem, they panic, they pray, and get provision. Most of us, that's what most of our lives are like, if we're in any kind of spiritual condition at all. We have problems. Anybody have a problem this week? Those that did not raise their hand, I've got a passel of them, I'll loan for you. Uh, you can do that. We all have problems. But the problem is, we take those problems and we panic with them. We begin to fret about them. We stir about them. We complain about them. We, we run from God because of them. And then finally we get to the place where we turn to God in prayer and then provision. The goal for our lives ought to be skip the panic part. Skip that part. Go right from problem to prayer and let God provide the need that we have. So we find that the children of Israel now are having repeated trials. Same trials seem to be happening all the time. Same trials seem to be coming upon them. They, there they were at the Red Sea, complaining against God. God had brought them to the Red Sea, and they complained against God. God delivered them through the Red Sea. They got out there and got to some place called Mara, and the water was there, and it was bitter, and they couldn't drink it. And they complained to God about that, and murmured and complained. God provided for them with the stick that thrown in there. The tree that was thrown in and the water became good enough to drink. Then they just went around the corner and came to a place that they said, there's no food here, we're, we're hungry, we're starving to death. And complaining against God, complaining against Moses and murmuring, and God sent the manna, the miracle manna, for the next 40 years they were going to eat upon. And now just the next chapter over, there they are again in a place with no water, and the first thing they do is not pray. The first thing they do is not they seek Moses, God, what would God have us do? They just start complaining and murmuring again. All through the Bible, God tells us these folks, they, God was proving them and testing them. So, we saw just the other day, when God brings a trial into your life, you're being proven. You're being tested. That may not be the main purpose of the tragedy. That may not be the main purpose of the event. But when trials come, God is testing us. He's given us an opportunity to trust Him. He's given us an opportunity to obey Him. He's given us an opportunity to lean on Him and still go forward. Children of Israel were not learning. They were not learning. You can't turn the page in this portion of the Bible without finding Israel complaining, Israel falling into sin, Israel murmuring. I mean, it was just became their habit. It became their lifestyle. Do you ever know somebody with that kind of lifestyle? That kind of habit? Every time you see them coming, you say, oh my. You're getting ready to give you a long list of all the problems and all the trials. By the way, I don't mind you telling me your problems. We can pray together. But how many know what I'm talking about? To somebody who's just, that's just all they do. Everything comes, no matter what comes in their life, they complain and they murmur. Let's strive that not that not be us today. Let's learn. It's been said God won't let us graduate to the next level until we pass the level that we're on. In other words, we have to take the same test over and over. How many remember that in school? Oh, I remember third grade. Mm, best five years of my life. But we don't go on until we pass. Well, God brings these same things. Children of Israel, they still haven't learned it, and they've got the same trials and same issues. If I was going to outline the next two chapters, it's going to, this chapter and the next one, it's Rephidim's waiting. That's what we're talking about this morning. Rephidim's wanting, and then Rephidim's water, and Rephidim's war. And we're only going to be looking at the first two this morning, and even those briefly. So, 
is the Lord among us or not? Very quickly, here we go. Number one, we find the waiting at Rephidim. The waiting at Rephidim. Notice what it says in chapter 17, verse number one. And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim and there was no water for the people to drink. Notice they were there by the commandment of the Lord. They were there how class? By the commandment of the Lord. God was leading them. Remember, he just didn't send them an email. He didn't send them a text. He had the pillar of fire at night, the pillar of cloud by the day, and they were following that day by day. As it would move, they would follow. As it would stop, they would stop. So God was leading them to Rephidim. They didn't decide, this is where we want to go. They didn't throw a little dart at the map and say, this is where we're going. God was leading them through the wilderness, leading them to Rephidim. Now, Rephidim... The word city, that name of that city area means to stretch out or refresh. To stretch out or refresh. That sounds like a good place to go. Amen? I like stretching out. I like being refreshing. And then it says they pitched in Rephidim. The word pitch there means to rest in your tent. So you hear the word Rephidim, and they pitch their tent in Rephidim, so they're getting rest, they're getting ready to stretch out, they're getting ready to be refreshed. So God is leading them there, and God says, we're stopping right here, we're pausing right here, I'm bringing you to this place. Now, while they're there at a place of refreshment, while they're there at a place of resting, that does not mean they're not going to have problems. See, when we're resting, that doesn't mean we won't have concerns. That doesn't mean we won't have trials. That doesn't mean we're not going to have difficulties in their life. So he brought them there, and they're waiting. They're waiting for the next step. They're waiting for God to move them. They're waiting for what God has for them. And so they're waiting. Let me challenge you with something. We spend a lot of our time waiting on God. Just waiting on God. When God moves, it's often very rapid. It's often very quick. But in the meantime, we have to do some waiting. And here's a basic thought for the idea of waiting at Rephidim. Waiting time must not be wasting time. Waiting time must not be wasting time. Boy, so often we get a place where we're resting or we get a place to stretch out. We get a little place of refreshment. And while, while we're waiting for something else, we just waste our time. I got news for you. We don't have enough time to waste. Hello? We don't have enough time to waste. Now, I'm approaching middle age now. I don't know how long, how long you plan on living, but I'm, I'm middle age now. But as I get older, I realize how little time we have. And obviously, I have less time ahead than I have behind. And so I need to understand that my waiting time, when I'm waiting on God, when I'm looking to God to move with something in my life, it cannot be wasting time. And it doesn't have to be wasting time. The Bible says in Ephesians 5, 16, redeeming the time, buying the time back, purchasing the time, redeeming the time because the days are evil. So we need to make sure while we're waiting, we're not wasting. While we're delaying, we're not ruining our lives or squandering our lives. The children of Israel, God brought them to a place of Rephidim, a place to wait. They're waiting at Rephidim. A place of rest, a place of refreshment, but a place where there's troubles. Say, so, preacher, what do you mean we should not be wasting our time? When we're waiting on God, it should be a restoring time. There's no, you can make notes in there in your notes, that's not a blank. But there should be a restoring time where it restores our energy, where it restores our strength. The Bible says in Psalm 27, 13, there in your notes, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of living. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. If he, uh, Isaiah 40, even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young man shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings of eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. It ought to be a restoring time, a building time, a recovering time, a strengthening time, strengthening our faith, strengthening our trust, strengthening our labor, strengthening our knowledge of the Word of God, strengthening our love for God. It ought to be a building time and a strengthening time. And all God's people said... Amen. So he said, well, I'm waiting on God. Well, what are you doing while you're waiting? Waiting is often a time of training where we're getting trained. 
where we begin to pr practice what we know we need to do. It's a time of testing. It's a time of learning. It's a time of trusting. Don't let waiting be a wasting time. God doesn't have us wait to be idle. Number two, and here's where we're going to spend most of the time because this is the crutch of the SERP message for this morning. We see the wanting at Rephidim. The wanting of Rephidim. They got to Rephidim. God led them there, but there was no water. God led them there to that place of refreshing. He led them to that place of rest. But while they were there, there were still problems. There were still difficulties. There was no water to drink. So here we find the wanting of Rephidim. And here's the wanting of Rephidim. Last part of verse number 7. It says, Because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? They said, We've got no water. Is God here? We've got no water. Is the Lord among us or not? We got here resting. We're here refreshing. We're just waiting on God. But there's no water. Is the Lord among us or not? First of all, I want you to notice the posing of the question. The posing of the question. The question they pose is, is the Lord among us or not? Now, that is the whole tone of this passage. That whole tone is their questioning attitude, is the Lord among us or not? Now, that question needs to be taken and looked at in two aspects. Are you still with me this morning? So I'm trying to help us. Two aspects. One, a legitimate question. It could be a legitimate question. Is the Lord with us or not? We don't see Him. We don't, we don't have any water and I'm concerned. I'm burdened. Is the Lord with us? Is there something I need to change? Is there something I need to do? Is the Lord with us or not? A legitimate question. Or what I believe we find here is not a legitimate question, but an accusation. They weren't asking the question, really, is the Lord with us or not? They were saying, why isn't God doing what I think he ought to do? Why isn't God obeying me? Why isn't God listening to me? Why isn't God taking care of everything I think I ought to have? So we got the two aspects. Is the Lord among us or not? The one is a legitimate question. Is the Lord among us or not? Do we need to change something? Do we need to alter something? The other one is accusations and insinuations. First, we're going to look at the real question. And we're going to ask it of ourselves. So here's the message. This is what we've got to look at, Lighthouse Baptist Church. Is the Lord among us or not? I'm asking us right now. Is the Lord among us or not? This must be our heart attitude. This must be our question. Because we must have the Lord among us. In your family, you must have the Lord among you. In our church, we must have the Lord among us. In my life and in my heart, I must be seeking that knowledge. I must be seeking that truth. Is the Lord among us or not? Now, the word among there, if you're taking notes, the word among is an interesting word. It means the nearest are in the center. The nearest are in the center. And it comes from a root word to mean to be at hand or to join. So the question we're asking is, is the Lord in the center of us or not? Is the Lord nearest to us than anybody else or not? Is the Lord at hand to me or not? Is the Lord joined to me or not? That must be our attitude. That's what began to break my heart as I studied this for you and for myself, that we would have a heart to say, I must have the Lord among us. I must have the Lord near me. You know, Moses, Moses had the right idea. Later on, we'll get, when we get there, if the Lord tarries, Exodus 33, Moses, God's getting ready to take them into the promised land. But because the children of Israel complained and murmured and didn't obey, I believe it's there in your notes, Exodus 33. Is it in your notes? Yes, Good. Notice what it says. And at that time, and, Mo, and the Lord said unto Moses, Depart, go up hence, thou and the people, which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, unto the land which I swear unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Unto thy seed will I give it. So he says, Go on up. I brought you here. Go ahead and take it. I will send an angel before thee. I will drive out the Canaanite, and the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Perzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. God says, We're here. I want you, I'm going to send you up. I'm going to send the angel ahead of you, and I'm going to drive out the inhabitants. But he says, for I will not go up 
in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. He said, we're here. He said, but I'm not going to go with you because you're stiff-necked. And as you rebel against me, he says, I'm going to have to chasten you. I'm going to have to deal with it. And he says, so I'm not going to go. Yeah. If I can put it this way. If God came to you today and says, I'm going to send you to a new job, and you're going to get four times the salary you're making now. They're going to give you a car to drive. You're going to get five weeks vacation a year. You're going to get a, a 401k. You're going to retire after five years with full pension. I'm going to you say, wow, wonderful. He says, but I can't be with you, and I can't bless you in my spiritual way. You say, that's all right. I'll take the job. That's all right. I'll do all I'll, Moses was not that way. He said, I'm going to send you to the land. The land flowing with milk and honey. He said, but I'm not going with you because you're rebellious. You're stiff-necked. In verse 15 of that same passage, here's Moses' answer in Exodus 33, 15. And he said unto him, Moses saying unto God, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. He said, if you're not going to be with me, I don't want to go. I don't care how much milk and honey it is. I don't care how much how good the land is. I don't care how much we're going to possess. I don't care how much many victories we'll get against the enemy. He said, if you're not with me, if your presence is not part of me, if you're not with me, I do not want to go. That's the spirit we need in our lives. Is the Lord among us or not? Now, it's true. If you're saved, He never really leaves us. Jesus said, I'll never leave thee, for nor forsake thee. Holy Spirit lives inside. He doesn't leave us. But there is a way, His power, His presence, His unity, that special presence in our lives may not be there. Oh, He's still there, but His power in our lives is not. His fellowship is not as clear as it ought to be. We break that fellowship. He's not left us, but His presence isn't there. His anointing isn't there. His real power isn't there. That union isn't there. I've got to have His union. I've got to have His presence this morning. Does that make sense this morning? Yes, He, does. he never leaves us nor forsakes us. We never lose our salvation. But having His presence, His working in our lives, that's what we must have. The children of Israel said, is the Lord among us or not? And our question for us, is the Lord among us? Is He present with us? Is He working presently? Is He joined with us or not? Very quickly, let's notice how we can have Him among us. Preacher, how can I make sure He's among us? What does the Bible tell us that we can have His presence? Because my heart's desire and my question this morning, is the Lord among us or not? Very quickly, I believe it's there in your notes, 2 Corinthians 15, 2. These are just some of the things God says. And the, man, the, the king was going out, and he, and he went out to meet Asa. And Asa, the preacher, said, Hear me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you. Wonderful. That's what we want. We want the God with us. We want God on our side. The Lord is with you while ye be with him. Wow. That tells me if I want, his pre if I want him with me, I got to be with him. Oh, I'm saved. He's still with me. But if I really want him to be with me, I need to be with him. I need to have that desire. God desires to be with me. He wants to be with me. But if I'm not desiring to have him, if I'm not willing to be with him, he said, I'm still here. He says, but I don't have that joining. I don't have that amongness that we're looking for. So it says, the Lord is with you while you be with him. And if you seek him, he will be found of you. Wonderful. God says, you can find me if you seek. How do we get that among us, that fellowship with us, that closest? One of one, that I, he'll be with me while I am with him. Yeah. While I'm with him, he's with me. If I stop being with him, guess what? He's not with me. Is that too hard to understand? As long as I'm with him, he's with me. Then I need to seek him. He goes on. But if ye forsake him, he will forsake you. If I go back, I'll be away from him. Now, for a long time, Israel had been without the true God, and without a teaching priest, and without the law. But when they, in their trouble, did turn unto the Lord of God, 
of Israel and sought him, he was found of him. What a wonderful passage. Boy, they rebelled. They got away. They didn't have a teaching priest. They never went after God. But the trouble came and they cried out and they sought him and God said, here I am. And all God's people said, amen. amen. So we can have him if we be with him, he'll be with us. If we seek him, we'll be found, he'll, we'll be, he'll be found of us. If we do not forsake him, he will not forsake us. So we can do that. Preacher, how can I gather him among us? God tells us, by going soul winning. By going soul winning. Boy, it got quiet. Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations Jesus after his resurrection, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever commanded you. So he's telling them, here's the mission. Go give the gospel. People are on the way to hell. They need to know I died for them. They need to know how to trust me as Savior. They need to be born again so they don't have to go to hell and they can go to heaven. He said, teaching them to observe all things that are commanded. So you teach them there, you see them saved, you baptize them, and then you teach them how to live right and tell others. And he said, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Yeah, I know Jesus never forsakes us, but God's making a promise there in context about he's with us when we go. All right, listen, when we go, he said, I'm with you. He said, as you go into all the world and preach the gospel and teach me, he says, I am with you. One of the exciting things is when you go out or you're talking to neighbors or knocking some doors, giving some gospel tracts, you know you're not alone because he is with us. Amen. Amen. So, preacher, how can I have that amongness? Well, I'll be with him. He'll be with me while I'm with him. I need to seek him. He'll be found of me. He won't forsake me if I don't forsake him while I go soul winning. By the way, Revelation warns us about getting away from that. The Bible says he'll remove the candlestick. He'll remove our title as a church if we get away from that first work. How else can I have him with me? One last one. Submission to. If I'm in submission to him. John 14, 23, there in your notes. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. Oh my, did you see that? He said, If a man love me, he will keep my words. Talk to me, class. So Jesus is saying, if I do not keep his words, I do not what? I don't love him. He said, if you love me, you keep my words. So if I'm not obeying the word of God, I see what it says, but I'm not obeying it. I am not loving him. Wow. No matter what we say, what we do. But he goes on. Jesus answered and said to them, if a man love me, he will keep my words and my father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He said, so me and the father, we're going to come unto him. We're going to make our abode. We're going to live with him. We're going to be among him as we submit to his word. Wow. The legitimate question, is the Lord among us or not? He wants to be. Wait a minute. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I'll be in the midst of them. So we gather and focus on the name of Jesus Christ. We gather and focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus. It's all about him. It's not about me. It's not about a denomination. It's about Jesus Christ. And as we gather together, he promises to be among us. Why did you come to church today? Did you come expecting to meet the Lord? Did you come expecting to be fed? Did you come expecting to, to hear from him? I hope so. Is he among us or not? So that's the legitimate question. We need to ask ourselves in our lives, is the Lord among us? Is the Lord among me? Is he in union with me? Is he the closest thing to me? Is he the nearest thing? That's what among means. A nearest, closest, or not? Looking at the question the other way, which I'm afraid too many of us have, it's a question of accusation. Not is he with us, but is he obeying us? They wanted water. They said, we're here in this place and we're thirsty. And they began to complain and murmur. And they said, is the Lord with us or not? In other words, how come God's not doing what I think he ought to do? How come God is not watering us like I think we ought to be watered? How come we've got these things going on? And I'm just murmuring and complaining. And so it was accusation. Ladies and gentlemen, it's real easy for us to get to that kind of spirit where we ask that. Same kind of question. Is the Lord with us or not? Does the Lord care about us or not? Does the, God, does the Lord love us or not? Does the, is the Lord leading us or not? Is the Lord among us or not? It was a question of accusation. So very quickly, let's notice the pathway to the question. The pathway to the question of the negative question. We saw the positive question. Whoa, I want, I want to be like Moses. 
Moses said, if you're not with me, I don't want to go. Don't bless me. Don't take me anywhere unless you're going with me. But here we have the negative of that question, the accusation where they're accusing God. Is, notice what it says in verse 7. And because they tempted the Lord, saying, they were trying the Lord. They were arguing with the Lord. Is the Lord among us or not? Very quickly, the pathway. How do we get to such a point? Because when we get to that point where we don't think God is with us, when we get to that place where we begin to accuse God of not caring for us, not doing what we think God ought to do, I should be well, I should be healthy, I should be rich, I should be as good looking as Pastor Bryson. <laughs> when we get to that place and we begin to say, is the Lord with us or not? We begin to backslide, we begin to cool off, we begin to stop serving, we begin to get a negative spirit. So, here's the question, how in the world do we do that? Here we go, the pathway to the question, how do we get to such a point? Number one, as we see in the passage with the children of Israel, esteeming the physical more than the spiritual. Esteeming the physical more than the spiritual. They were there because God led them. They were there because they were God's people. Back as slaves, they cried to God to deliver them. We're your people, God, deliver us. So he delivered them, and he's leading them. But now, they have the choice of being a little thirsty and still loving God and serving God and looking to God or being thirsty and denying God. They were esteeming the physical more than the spiritual. But when we start doing that, when the physical means more to us than the spiritual like it did them, they said, we're thirsty now. What are we going to do? How are we going to do it? We're, beginning, we're down that pathway where in our lives we'll say, is God with us or not? We need the kind of attitude like Job had. Job 13, 17, Job said, with all the things went on in his life, the loss of his family, the loss of his health, the loss of his possessions, he said, though he, meaning God, slay me, even if he kills me, Yet will I trust him, but I will maintain my own ways before him. He says, even if he kills me, I'm going to trust him. Apostle Paul said in Philippians 1.20, According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by what class? Death. The idea is we get to the place where the spiritual supersedes and overpowers all physical needs. If I do not have what I physically need, I still have what I spiritually need. And I emphasize the spiritual in my life over the physical. But see, we get all wrong when we start emphasizing the physical over the spiritual. Stay with me. I'm trying to help us. This is a challenge as we see the children of Israel putting everything they have on the physical and not the spiritual. Very quickly, we are always wrong when we measure all things by money and not mission and ministry. Are you listening to me? We are always wrong when we begin to measure all things by money and not mission or ministry. When we put physical, the money I have, the bank account I have, the house I have, all those things, when I had that above the spiritual and I measure my success based upon that, I am headed for the question is the Lord among us or not? Does God care or not? They put that physical above the spiritual. When, all, when, it, when our life is based upon finances and not faith, we're headed down that path because we're putting the physical, this old world, and not faith. See, we forget, we live in America where, we, where the poorest of us as Americans are rich compared to anybody else in the world. We are so blessed. You look at Christianity, any time in all of history, America has been unique in the blessings and the luxuries and the protection and the freedoms we have. And so we get to the place now where we expect that same physical. No, we must emphasize the spiritual more than the physical. So if it's all finances and not faith, we're headed down the wrong path. If it's all about comfort and not Christ, we're headed down the wrong path. Oh, we've got to be willing to follow Christ, take up our cross and follow Him, deny ourselves, whatever it is. And that doesn't mean I'm looking to be uncomfortable. I like comfort. I like my recliner. I like the places I have. But I cannot esteem that more than Christ. If by following Christ I have to lose some comfort, I need to be willing to lose some comfort. Yeah. 
If I'm not willing to lose some comfort and start complaining, I don't, I don't want about Christ. I just know that I'm not satisfied. My house is too small. My house is too big. My car is this and my car is that. Oh, I'm headed the wrong thing. When we put riches here above riches there, we're headed the wrong way. I preached just not too long ago on filling your heavenly barn. If you haven't read, heard that message, I want you to go back and listen to it. Filling our heavenly barn. It says in Luke 12, 20, the rich man, if you remember, the rich man said, I'm no, I don't know what I'm going to do. I got too much stuff. He said, I know what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger barns and I'll fill them. And then I'm going to sit back and take my ease and enjoy life. In other words, he was focused on building and filling his earthly barn. And so my thought from that message was, your earthly barn may be full, but what about your heavenly barn? We got a mansion, that's being given. See, Christ is building us the mansion. That's His responsibility. Our responsibility is to fill up our barn. Lay up treasures in heaven. Lay up treasures in heaven. So we talk about that. And so when that rich man said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to tear down my old barns and build bigger and fill them up. And God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall these things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, that's here, and not rich toward God. That's there. See, we're, we're headed down the wrong path like the children of Israel when we esteem physical and finances more than the spiritual. The finances here more than there. I was thinking about, I don't think I've told this story here in many years. Anybody remember what cash is? You know, the paper money. Well, back in the day when they used that a lot, that money would wear out. And you know, when the money wore out, they'd take it to the banks, and the banks would sit up, and they would burn it. They would burn the money. So it would be on a conveyor belt, and they'd go burn the wore out money. Well, the story is, on that conveyor belt going through, by the way, this is not a real story, in case you're wondering. <laughs> there was two bills next to each other. One, a $100 bill, and one, a $1 bill. And they were headed to the incinerator together, and the $100 bill says, man, what a life I had. Oh, boy. He said, I've been to Las Vegas a hundred times. I've been to Reno more times than I can count. I've been to Paris. I've been to every football and baseball stadium in our country. He said, I've been to every vacation spot in this world. He said, boy, I've just, I have lived it up. I've been in all the fanciest restaurants. What a life I've had. He turned to the $1 bill and says, how was your life? What was your life about? Where'd you go in your life? Just church. And a hundred dollar bill looked at him and said, what's church? <laughs> Amen. You know, 20 years ago, preachers used to say, don't just throw a dollar in the offering plate and think you're doing God a big favor. Nowadays, those same people are still throwing in a dollar, but how, much under, how many understand a dollar is nothing anymore? It's nothing. How'd I get on that? Oh, that's right. Your heavenly barn. When we put the money in the offering plate and you give for God's service and God's... And I'm not talking about just so the pastor can go to Tahiti. <laughs> but we're talking about service and getting money to God and investing in the people of the world and seeing souls saved. We are putting treasures in heaven. So, wanting it referendum, the pathway to the question where they said, is Lord among us or not? Again, they weren't really asking. They were criticizing. They were attacking. They were insinuating that God did not care. How do we go down that when we esteem the physical more than the spiritual? Oh, moms and dads, let's make sure we're teaching our kids spiritual more than physical. Hello? Amen. Number two, we forget the journey. We forget the journey. If we sing that song very often, this world is not my home. The children of Israel had forgotten they were on a journey. They got to the place where they said, is the Lord among us or not? They forgot the journey. They forgot how they got there. How they got there. Remember, the Lord was leading them. Here it is. Every day, it never went out, it never disappeared. At night, the pillar of fire, a huge pillar of fire that warmed them and kept them safe from their enemies. During the day, it would change into a pillar of cloud, and they followed that. It led them. There it was. So while they, <laughs> while they were saying, is the Lord among us or not, Moses could say, uh, could you step away? The cloud's blocking you. Is the Lord among us or not? Well, I can't quite tell because the light from that fire tonight is awful bright. 
See, they forgot they were on the journey. The Lord led them there. They were following that, but they said, is the Lord among us or not? They forgot how they got there. You and I get to the place where we start questioning God when we forget we're on a journey. We're on a journey, and we forget how we got here. The children of Israel went from the misery of slavery. By the way, you got saved. You were under the, in the slavery to the devil. You were in slavery to the world. You were in slavery, slavery to the flesh. And when God saved you, what a miracle that was. He delivered you out of that. And we forget that we're on a journey. They were in slavery of misery. Then they got freed by the miracle of salvation. The blood on the doorposts and lentils. God delivered them in a miraculous way. Where King Pharaoh just said, no, go, go, go. Taken through the Red Sea. The means of security and sovereign leading. And as they were just following day by day the cloud, day by day by the fire, Wow, they forgot what they were all going. They forgot where they came from. They forgot the manner of supply. Again, they just came from the manna. They just came from the water that was turned from bitter to good. They just came from the Red Sea. They had all these miracles. They forgot about the journey. And now because they're thirsty again, now the situation is not like they want. They begin to criticize and attack God. Oh, we need to remember we're on a journey. Remembering where we came from. I remember where I came from. I was an old drunken sailor before God saved me. I'm not proud about that. The day before I got saved that night I was a, it was a Sunday morning when I got saved after a t- typical Saturday night for a sailor where I'd been drinking and not doing what I should have been done and God were, moved on my heart and saved me I was just a typical old sailor I was a typical old sinner I was away from God but God opened my eyes of where I was headed what Jesus Christ had done for me what my wife had told me what the preachers had told me and opening up that little New Testament to give all the sailors and reading there in the Norfolk Naval Base and realize what Jesus Christ did for me and all of a sudden God opened my eyes and I could see I was headed Headed for hell, but God didn't want me to go there, and He saved me. Whoa, my journey started. And when I forget about that journey, when I forget what God has done, then I'm liable to get to the place where I say, you know, I don't have enough. I don't have what I want. I'm a little bit thirsty. I'm a little bit hungry. Is the Lord with me or not? They forgot where they came from. They forgot where they were going. I must hurry. They were going to the promised land, the land of milk and honey. Wow, they're going to create a place of great blessings. I'm I'm thirsting out, but do you know where I'm going? Wow, if we just remember where we're going, we're headed to heaven. We're headed, as we sang about the streets of gold and the pearly gates, and Jesus there waiting for us. When we remember where we're going, all right, I'm a little thirsting out, I'm a little difficulty now, but I'm not going to complain because God is preparing a mansion, God is working in my life, and i got to remember where I'm going. Very quickly. How do we get down there? Children of Israel. How do they get to the place where God's people said, is the Lord among us or not? In a criticizing manner. Esteeming the physical more than the spiritual. Oh, be careful. When we forget the journey. Very quickly, when we focus on the lack and not the Lord. When we focus on the lack and not the Lord. All right, they didn't have any water. I'm not saying they weren't thirsty. I'm not saying they weren't concerned. I'm not saying they weren't struggling. But they focused on the lack and not the Lord. Like the widow and the meal. She just, she said, we're going to make this little meal and we're going to die. The preacher says, no. He says, you make it for me first and God will take care of it. Like the little boy with five loaves and two fishes. In John 6, 9, he said, there's a lad here that had five loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? He's looking at how little they have, looking at the lack instead of a, the Lord who's got all the answers. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. All the housing, all the... Just seek the kingdom of God. Moms and dads, get your kid an education, but ladies and gentlemen, the spiritual has to outseed, exceed the physical. I'm awfully a little quiet in here. If God wants your child to be a doctor then let him be a doctor and let her be a doctor and encourage him to be a doctor. But if God wants him to be a missionary, let him be a missionary. But they don't make a lot of money. So, we focus on the mission and the ministry and not the money. Because you're leaving it all here. Well, I don't want my kid there because they, have, they, might, they might get too spiritual. Well, I can't send them to camp because they might get spiritual. They might actually get saved. Or if they are saved, they might hear God's call to be a missionary or a pastor or a pastor's wife. I don't want any of that. I've got plans for them. No. 
If you want to avoid the place where it says, is the Lord among us or not, it's the spiritual over the material. Very quickly, focus on the lack and not the Lord. Then we begin to complain and murmur, complain and murmur. That's what they did. The Bible says, do all things without murmuring and disputing. They had their carnal thinking. We just talked about it. Then they begin to chide with Moses, pick at Moses, argue with Moses, attack Moses. Then came the contention. They demanded, give us water to drink. Wow. By the way, when you contend with God, that's futile. When you contend with God, it's wicked. When we contend with God, it's harmful. Say, okay, preacher, how can I take the right steps? Here we go and we'll be done. How can I make sure I do not get to the place where I get my, shake my fist at God and says, are you among us or not? Do you care about us or not? Do you have a desire for us or not? Do you want anything good for us? Why is it? To avoid that very quickly, number one, we do just the opposite. We esteem the spiritual more than the physical. Go home today and say, man, I'm going to focus on the spiritual things in my life. Uh, more than the physical, more than the finances, more than the house, more than... The, I'm going to focus and emphasize the spiritual things because that is eternal. Then number two, remember you're on the journey. They forgot, I'm on my way to heaven. I'm on the way to that successful Christian living. God is taking me on a journey. He's leading me. It's not my path. It's His path. And if I get a little thirsty in the way, that is fine because i got to remember where I'm I'm going. Number three, focus on the Lord and not your lack. Focus on what you have. You got the Holy Spirit. You're on your way to heaven. He's never going to take the Holy Spirit away from you. Whoa, well, I don't have, well, I'm driving an old car. Hope you get a new car. But in the words of that great theologian, bless your pea-picking heart. Brother Roy, nobody knows who that is. Focus on the spiritual more than the physical. Remember we're on a journey. Focus on the Lord and not the lack. And then forbid yourselves to murmur and complain. Forbid ourselves to murmur and complain. You know, again, we're not, you, don't, you address problems and you need to, but just complaining and murmuring because it makes you feel good or you stir up other folks. No, let's do that. The wanting at Rephidim. Oh, what's well, a talk about the water that was provided. What a miracle that was. But the whole idea is that attitude is the Lord among us or not. Let's live so that we ask the question seriously. Is the Lord among us or not? How do I make sure He is? How do I enjoy that fellowship? How do I enjoy His presence? And not get to the place where is the Lord among us or not? How come I don't? How come He isn't? Let's keep that heart right. So the first question, let's make it personal. Is he with you? Is he with you? Say, so how does that happen? When you get saved. When you get saved. He's not with you before. You get saved not in the way he's with you, like after you get saved. He may work on your heart, but boy, when I got saved, he came in to me. Never leave me. Woo! He's with me. Is he with you? Are you saved? See, the Bible says we're all rotten sinners. Because of our sin, we deserve hell, but Christ died for us because God loves us so much. He paid hell for you and for me. And if we'll believe and call and promise, He promises to save us. Wow. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and he with me. <laughs> at age 19, I can start saying, The Lord's with me. The Lord's with me. But if I'm not careful, I get to the place where I can say, I don't know if the Lord's with me or not because of this and because of that. Is he with you, Christian? Do you desire it? Have you lost it? Let's get it back. Let's bow our heads, please. Father, we thank you so much for your word. And Lord, the children of Israel are no different than each of us. They'd already been thirsty once and you miraculously changed their water. They were hungry. You miraculously were feeding them manna. They were about to be captured by the, their slave holders that were coming after them again, and you delivered them. And I hear they're complaining again. Father, I ask that you help us just remember the spiritual condition we're in if we're saved. Oh, what a difference that will make. Oh, the joy that we have. Help us 
Make sure our wanting is right. Father, to somebody here that's not saved, Lord, I pray that you'll save them today. Please, God, help us. In Jesus' name we pray. As we stand to our feet and the instruments play, a little bit of a challenge, a little direct, but that's what the children of Israel needed. That's what I need to be reminded. When I get to that place and say, well, if God was with me, I wouldn't be sick. If God was with me, I wouldn't have this financial trouble. If God was among me and among us, we wouldn't have these uh, accusations. If God was among us, we, no, no, no. My concern is the Lord among, is the Lord among us or not? I want him there. And when I've got him there, that's all I need. When I make the spiritual more important than the physical. When the church is more important than clubs. When souls are more important than worldly society. And helping my family grow to serve God. It's more important than having them grow to make money. Remember, I'm on the journey. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these other things be added. Look to the Lord and not to the lack. And ask God to help us not murmur and complain. Not sure you're saved? Step out right now. We'll have a man with a man, lady with a lady. Take the word of God and show you from the Bible how to be saved. Won't scare you, won't pressure you, just want to share the gospel. One last thought while you're praying. Hope your mind hasn't wandered. Lighthouse Baptist Church, is the Lord among us or not? If we're with Him, He'll be with us. If we seek Him, He'll let us find Him. If we do not forsake Him, He won't forsake us. If we're getting the gospel out, He says, I'll be with you. I'll be with you. If we're submitting Him, for loving Him and taking His word, He and the Father will dwell with us.